Many thanks to all of you for visiting with us tonight for this, the second of three presentations in August in support of this absolutely wonderful exhibit of photographs from Afghanistan by Friday Barber's James Longley. And I wanted to recognize his mother, Allison Longley, who is with us here. So thank you so much for, for being with us. And we look forward to seeing James on the 28th and the 31st. Uh, details of these presentations are on this card that's uh, on your chair. Uh, and uh, along with a handout that we have regarding tonight's uh, speaker, that's also on your, uh, on your chair. Um, uh, please note that James will also be speaking on Sunday, August 28th from five to seven at the Orca Center in East Sound on Orca's Island. And my deepest thanks go out to Rebe Luckhart and Barbara Cox for their really invaluable assistance in making this speaker series possible. And, and many thanks to Diane Martindale and Mark Kyle for assistance in getting the word out. The Ask Us About Afghanistan series here at the Museum of Art is providing opportunities to learn about Islam and the culture of Afghanistan, advocacy for women and children there, and paths to understanding Afghanistan as exhibited in James Longley's art, as well as personal stories of everyday life in dialogue with Reverend Terry Kylo, uh, all leading to a better understanding of this ancient and troubled region. All these events are free and no reservations are required. So now I'm very pleased and honored to introduce our speaker, Marnie Gustafson, a tireless activist for women and children in Afghanistan for over 15 years, for over 16 years, excuse me. Marnie Gustafson is the executive director of PARSA, a private organization founded in 1996. PARSA is an international nonprofit based in Kabul where she resided for five years of her childhood. In her work as executive director and as a consultant, Marnie creates new approaches to social problems using humanity's create creativity, resilience, and its abilities. Her international work focuses on developing leaders who have an appreciation for human interconnectedness and an interest in developing sustainable systems that promote equality and economic opportunities for all people. PARSA supports communities as they make their own development solutions, focusing on promoting social change in a healthy and fair society for all people, but especially women and children, the most vulnerable. Understanding the importance of community partnership, three groundbreaking PARSA programs highlight their mission. Along with the Ministry of Education, PARSA has helped revive the 80-year-old Afghan Scouts program. With the Ministry of Social Affairs, PARSA has the Healthy Afghan Child program and is working to initiate change in the Afghan National Orphan Orphanage System to ensure the most vulnerable children can have care in this post-conflict country. In 2013, PARSA launched a marketing network for women entrepreneurs called Trade Afghan to provide access to markets for fall for small farmers and producers. Marnie Gustafson, Gustafson was featured in Christian Amanpour's 2009 documentary, Generation Islam. She was educa educated at Antioch University, Cornish Art Institute, the University of Washington, and Whitman College. The title of Marnie's presentation is The Life of My Choice, 21 Years in Kabul, and there will be time afterwards for questions following her presentation. So please welcome Marnie Gustafson. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to make it stand. I may have to pull up a chair. And, do you guys mind? If we, can you can you hear me in back? Yeah. Do you guys mind if I get a little less formal and? Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. 
So um, first off, I want to say that I met James Longley in Afghanistan, in our in where my um, where I live and where I work at Parsa uh, early on in his career. So we actually had quite a long talk just as he was getting started, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here to understand that he came from Friday Harbor and. Um, <laughs> Uh, he had a really, I think, remarkable opportunity to be able to focus on his art in Kabul. And um, I, you should be very proud of him. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks for having me up here. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about my life and my work. And we're, then we're going to move into questions and answers. I'd like to introduce Reese Hume. He is my son. Uh, he lived for, with me for 10, me and um, his stepdad for 10 years in Kabul. So he has, he, he's brought me up here. He also has been part of my story, which I'll tell a little bit about. So um, I was in Afghanistan before the war with my family. Uh, my father taught at the American International School in Kabul. My parents wanted it to go overseas and have an adventure, and they applied, or my, my father applied to a school in Germany, and an offer came back from Kabul, and they said, what the heck? <laughs> and it was, um, it was, it was a defining moment in my life, in my family's life, living in Kabul during that particular time. It was uh, a backward place, nothing like what it has been the last 20 years. It was modern back then compared to what I've been a part of. Um, there was a very thriving international community that I grew up in. And um, I can just say uh, that it was, uh, it was just, it was a dream. It was a dream for me. It was wonderful in the sense of we had no television, we had no phones, we entertained ourselves, and we were in a very kind of exotic and intense um, country. And I liken it. I've likened it to the for me in my life is the difference between living living life in black and white and living life in color. So for me, Afghanistan's always been living life in color. Um, I uh, came back with my family when I was about 13 and went on to live my life uh, having no um, access to come to Afghanistan. When the Taliban fell the first time, uh, she says, hopefully. <laughs> um, it was a good time in my life and it was when I wanted to come back. And I came back initially with about 17 other, other people like myself who had gone to the American International School of Kabul. And we came back in, I think, 2003, very shortly after Taliban fell and toured the country for the first time since we were teenagers, really. And then went home and found myself back three months later with my, uh, my sister and another group. And went home and, and found myself back. I, I did this about four times. And finally, I said to my husband, I think we better move there because this is going to get expensive. <laughs> going back and forth. So um, uh, Af Kabul, Afghanistan uh, in 2004 was similar to as it is now, quite conservative. It was just coming out of its, coming out of its shell and trying to get used to uh, being in the new world. It was quite comfortable. Uh, and I found myself comfortable. Um, 
I just found my, I don't know how to describe it. I'm still like this there, which is just that I'm at home and uh, enjoy the people. I'm, my Dari's, my Farsi's not that great, but I communicate very clearly. And I just was uh, very much home there. I, when I, when I took my husband back, finally to live there, and I was working with the UN Women, what's now called UN Women, uh, we, we decided to move in with a woman named Mary McMakin, and she was the founder of Parsa. And she, I have to tell you really honestly, she was so glad that we came and moved in and left like two weeks later <laughs> without paying the, the payroll of the staff. Oh. So I found myself within about three weeks with the staff, you know, knocking on my door, asking me questions and asking me when they would get their paycheck. I uh, made the decision about two years we, we thought we were going to live with Parsa for a month or two. And about a year and a half, two years into it, uh, we all moved, all of Parsa. I've actually, I think I've lived with, in Parsa since, I, since that, time, that time. I lived in Parsa with the staff. And then Mary, uh, Mary is still alive. She's like, I think, 92. She did leave the country during the fall of the Taliban. She's an intrepid, um, stubborn, uh, irrepressible woman. And she started, PARSA stands for Physiotherapy and Rehabilitation Support, which is a, a name we were assigned by the government back then. And she's a physiotherapist. I decided at some point to stop doing work outside of PARSA and just took it on as an organization. It was quite tiny when I took it on, but I wanted to be part of an organization where I could shape and respond to what I see was needed, and um, I could do that through PARSA. Today, I have people still working, for, quite a few people still working for me that, knew, that have been with us since that, that particular time. So to some degree, we're kind of, we are a family in that regard. Uh, let me see, I wanna get, there's 18 years, I don't wanna cover all of it. <coughs> Um, the, as, as I started working with my staff and working with our beneficiaries and started putting my mark, I'm not a physiotherapist, putting my mark on PARSA, uh, what I discovered was needed was to develop leaders. And how you develop leaders is you give them accountabilities and primarily give them accountabilities for putting into effect that which they see, that which they want, that what is what um, start holding them to account for their country and the things that they see need, needing change. So Parsis, when, when I describe it, sounds like, like, what do you do? Will you work with kids? Will you work with women? Will you work on these, you know, what does Parsa do? And it's a little sprawling because it is an environment that, tra because Parsa is an environment that trains leaders. So how we have our, our courses how we have our work is based on what my staff do or who I've grabbed out of the community who is remar has a remarkable vision for Afghanistan. And that's really the core of what we are. Uh, so initially I inherited, and I'm just gonna tell you some, a couple of stories that have shaped my life. 
initially we inherited a women's economic program. And when you're new, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that I've spent so much time there. But when you're new, and for me, new is six years. For most people, new is like six months. But for me, new is six years. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, um, I had this very prestigious job in my eyes of training the first parliamentarians uh, as in leadership. And then I <coughs> discovered that uh, they wouldn't turn their cell phones off for anything. So there I am pontificating about leadership, and they're on their phones. And nothing I did, pass, I, I make people pass through and pick up the phones, nothing I did curtailed this. And when I saw that, I said to myself, you know what, you know nothing about being a leader in this culture, Marnie, nothing. And it actually began a whole self project of uh, training myself to be able to lead in that context. And for me, leading was, has, and has always been uh, leading leaders, leading and training leaders. So um, our first project was women's economy. You know, I have to tell you, uh, living in Afghanistan is the, for me, the most humbling experience of my life. It's just how every day you wake up, you think you know what you're going to do, you think you know how you're going to do it, and um, the Afghans take a twist and you are like, what? And how could you come up with that conclusion and why would you go that direction? So Afghanistan, uh, it, it really is a mystery day after day after day, even as, as much as, as well as I know Afghans. So women's economy, I inherited this economic project where um, we had a gift shop and we made things, or I didn't make things, the women made things and they sold things. And I, um, <laughs> I so much of the media, every time that Afghan women so much of the media pert really portrays Afghan women as victims. And I personally feel victimized by Afghan women. I just want you to know. <laughs> so I, one of my great stories about uh, women and uh, women and economics is a woman I call Bibi John. I was on a break up in the Bamiyan Valley and I was walking up this friend had recommended that I walk up this beautiful valley just as a break for the weekend. And I came upon about an 11-year-old girl beating a donkey who had rice on it. And the donkey was quite ill. It had diarrhea. So I actually stopped her. I'm an animal lover. I stopped her and said, you know, you can't do that. What's going on? And she said, I have to get this rice up the hill to my mother, to my family. She was in tears, so I, I pulled the rice off the donkey and told her to go get another, uh, ask a, up, the, up the road, ask for another donkey to come down and get her rice, which she did. And then she invited me up the hill in Afghanistan, up is the poorest area, not, and down by the river is the wealthy area. So we went way high up to the, and found this widow who, uh, she had five daughters. Her husband had been killed by the Taliban. And she was kind of a mean, mean looking. She actually, she actually chewed snuff. And she was mean looking. But I was there and I said, and they were obviously very impoverished. I said, you know, Bibi John, can I give you $10? Would that help? And she said, I don't want your money. I don't want your charity, I want work. So I said, okay. So I invented a quilt. It's a crazy quilt that's off the model of the traditional. I said, Bibi John, I'll set up my staff in two weeks with winter work for you and your daughters, and I'll pay you. That's what I can do for you. So I have my staff piece about five quilts, and what all they do is they just do this hand stitching 
around it. It's been constructed. He, uh, my staff member, Tahir, who's still with me, took up five quilts to BB John over the winter and to do the work over the winter. And next spring, we paid her $50, $10 a quilt. And then came back during the summer. She said, OK, I'm ready. We can do 10 quilts now. I said, fine. And they actually did, they actually did sell. And then following, uh, by summer, she had bought a cow with her money. And the following year, we did the winter work. and. By the next summer, and, and I checked on her every summer, she had a cow and 10 goats. And then in the third year, she actually told, um, she told my staff member where he could shove his winter work. <laughs> and when I visited her about five years later, she had moved down to the river, and she had her her goats, and she had her um, her cows, yeah. And she was quite a wealthy woman. That, for me, is the magic of the African spirit. I don't know where they come up with it. I don't know what happens. But one of the things that makes my life so enjoyable there is that they are, I had somebody say, I wish they were more creative. And I'm like, and I'm like please, no. <laughs> no more. I don't know. I don't know what Afghans you're dealing with. I really mind kind of calm down the creativity. So that's when, for me, women. One of the things is it's hard for me, and I like to say uh, American audiences, they're not victims. Now they live brutal lives. They are brutalized. Uh, they are in one of. The, probably the most repressive country right now for women's rights. And it really is. It's worse. In, not in the sense of the physical abuse, in the sense of the emotional, social abuse. Uh, that's been the most discouraging thing for me. That's actually been the thing I've worked on for the last year, almost 24 hours 7 with my staff and with my beneficiaries and anybody I can work there, which is this sense of being oppressed, this sense of there's no hope, I'll never go to school, I'll never be able to work, I'll never, I'll never be able to leave the house. I had also in the same valley, one of the most remark, one of the, mo the things I learned the most was a woman, and I was talking to people in this valley, B.B. Jones Valley, and uh, I said, well, do you want liter you know what why do you want a literacy class? Why do you want one? And she and this one woman said is I am in my life no better than a cow. I'm about the same as a cow. But if I read, I'll be something different. So uh women are my, I, I have no experience of African women being victims. And I, I do pretty difficult work. You know, I talk with women who have been beaten by their husbands, who, who have really been harmed. I have no sense of them being victims. I get annoyed when I see them presented as victims. And now I'm just going to fast forward, and, which is that really the difficult part for me this last year has been the drive to get out of Kabul and the narrative that the Afghans have adopted because about being victims. And that is an upsetting narrative for me because it's not my experience of them. It's tough. But, uh, and particularly the women. And there are very specific cases where they do need to get out of the country. But out of 125 staff, one in my staff was somebody I supported in leaving because they were being targeted. And I'm not even sure about that. But I don't, one of the things I consider pretty unhealthy is the media narrative of Afghans as victims. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more in Q&A. You can ask me more about that. Um, I wanted, one of the 
programs that we did so we uh, that I wanted to tell you about because Reese is here and I haven't haven't in the last couple of years had a chance to tell this story. We started working in the national orphanages uh, and I was so frustrated because I couldn't get the orphanage staff out from behind their desk to interact with the kids. So they, they drank tea, the kids played and raised themselves, and I couldn't get them from behind the desk. And I was fussing about it, and Reese and I were driving, Reese was driving me up a, mount, up a mountain pass, the Shabar Mountain Pass, and it was snowy, and um, we saw a family whose van had tipped over into the ditch, and he said, "Hey, mom, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and just pull them out." So he stopped, went around to the back, rummaged around in the back, and within about five minutes, he had the van up on the road and pulled out. And when he came back into the car, he said. I said, Reese, where the heck did you learn that? Because I didn't teach you that. <laughs> you, know? you, ha you actually had a rope in the back. You know, you actually had the things you needed to. Where did you learn that? He said, Scouts, Mom. Yeah, I learned that in Scouts. And I said, Oh my God, that's it. That's what I need to, in the orphanages. Is I need Scouts troops. I need Scouts programs. That's perfect because they start to kind of raise themselves. There's a sense of pride. Uh, it's not that dependent on adults. So one of the thing, one of the projects, I don't remember, Reese, how early on this was in, in your trip there. It was pretty early on. One of the projects is we went to the ministry all together and we said, hey, we want to sign up for your scout program. They said, oh, you want to fund it? <laughs> I said, no, we want to do it. And he said, okay. I said, do you have a manual or do you have anything? He said, no, nothing, nothing. We have 20,000 scouts, though. Right. So we went back and we went online and Reese, Reese and Mosin, I think, it was you and Mosin, did you, and Yasin, yeah. And then we created a scout troop in, we didn't, I mean, Reese did with Mosin, with, uh, with a uniform which they made up. We found an old handbook somewhere for the Boy Scouts of America and just started Scouts troops. And uh, that first troop, first two troops, I think, I think we did two troops then. What happened is we met two people that had been trying to do Scout revive the scouts in Afghanistan because before the war there was a huge scout program before the war funded through the education through education and we found two people Tamim and Mustafa who came in and of course they had a lot of opinions how we did our scout program right <laughs> what they weren't doing well no they weren't but they sure wanted to take over ours didn't they and the long and the short of it is, I found $1,500, hired these two, and 10 years later, before the fall of the Taliban, the National Scout Program had 10,000 children in it, 600 volunteers. That's through our work. And we're, we register, we were registered with the World Organization Scout Movement, or re-registered. We actually, um, to me and I, one of the things we were in tears over was we were trying to get Parsa ready for this imminent takeover. As we sat with the commissioner, the international commissioner, and accepted registration for Afghanistan last year. So for me, that's the power of um, supporting leaders. Because it, they took it on. They did that. Reese went on to start Job Corps, which now is still struggling. If you would like to come back and do some more work on that one. <laughs> um, that's a remarkable story. It started with $1,500. Uh, the U.S. Embassy ended up funding it almost to almost about 
uh, $5 million over the course of seven years. Uh, and it's one of the, it is the pr primary youth program in Afghanistan. Just started by two people who just were going to have a scout, two Afghans who were going to have a scout, a national scout program no matter what. And that for me is the strength of developing leaders. So, uh, the other thing that I did is this, the kids in Kabul, the girl, actually the girls, girl, my, our girls are, are pretty amazing. They came to me one day and they said, Marnie, Scouts is only like one day a week and then we just get to do community service. We want to, we want to be at parts of five days a week. We want computer. We want English, we want uh, speaking classes, and we want sports. So, I mean, what can you say? <laughs> so we started a program called Sisters for Sisters. We were, I don't know, I, uh, we were just featured anonymously in Ms. Magazine. One of our women was, in her, one of our girls that I've known since she was nine years old. Uh, was recently interviewed about her experience of parts it during the fall and what happened. So I should try to make that available, to, the link available to someone. So three years ago, three or four years ago, we started the Sisters for Sisters program, and they are just scary people. I mean, just scary people. And we have, there are, I don't know how to describe it, but I somehow managed to teach the staff. Most staff, not just in Afghanistan, in, in social work, feel like they need to have a purpose. In other words, if they're not working, if they're not doing something, what am I paying them for? And to be a staff member with youth at Parsa is lots of not working and sitting around listening to ideas and saying, go do it. So, uh, I think I, I want to just kind of wrap up just about what PARSA has become by just telling you about uh, my experience of the fall of Kabul. None of us expected, none of us expected the government to collapse. My security, I had an in, international security director who was with me. I was going out on medical leave. Uh, I was planning on actually coming back because we did think there was going to be a big change sep September 12th or so. So I was planning on going on a medical leave and coming back and being there for that because an older woman like myself who's comfortable there is a really good face for dealing with that kind of change. We didn't expect, like I said, we didn't expect for Kabul to fall, but um, I was, got on the plane in the morning, and by the time I, to, to Dubai, by the time I landed in Dubai, Kabul was gone. And I was on the phone with my staff, and it really, I was quite frankly on the phone with my staff for the entire time that I was at home until I was able to get back in. It was one of the first internationals that got back in in late October. And that was just because the planes weren't flying, nobody knew what a visa was. It wasn't that there was a danger, it was more that it was just massive chaos. One of the things I did as was spend a lot of time contacting my staff and they were really frightened. Uh, I, the two things that we started is we got, got a group of about 25 English teachers online uh, who started English classes on WhatsApp with all of the youth in Kabul. And that's one of the things we did. The other thing is, is that a group of mental health professionals pulled together and we started doing psych or psychosocial programming. We started doing, there's a manual put out by WHO called doing what matters during times of stress, specifically around conflict. So I spent at least two months, and I focused on the women and the girls because the Taliban, one of the things we had to do immediately was separate the men and women. 
so that we, we actually have almost seven buildings on this very, very large 20-acre um, farmland Afghan recrescent area, which is just gorgeous. But we had to put them up in what we call Parsa Family Village 1, which is a combination of shelter and activities. I had to put everybody up there, but and, until I got into the country, our staff had a tendency just to forget them out of sight, out of mind, and they were, they didn't, which is very, very, you know, much a, the problem with the culture, which is they weren't getting the, they were terrified because they're up there and they weren't getting the information they needed, you know, they, they weren't being included. So I, we started these um, psychosocial classes and one of the things I did which was my leadership statement is Parsa is staying, Parsa serving people in country. So I ha was obligated to, obligated to refer my staff to P2, whether they were at risk or not. I was just obligated by the US government to do that. But I made it very clear with my staff that I, I'm, I'm here uh, to work in Afghanistan and to go through this particular change and that's what PARS is going to be about and that's what we're going to focus on. We lost about 25% of our staff to my migration ef efforts, and I say efforts because not many have made it yet. And, but I, I took a pretty hard nose, hard line with them and I did that because one is uh, immigration is really, really hard. And in this particular scenario these days, immigrants don't have the opportunity, don't have that much opportunity in the sense that there's so many of them now. And the systems weren't set up and it was done in such a rushed way. And I, you know, I said, I, I'm just, I know it looks awful right now. I know it looks, I'm discouraged, but we're going to stay in Afghanistan and we're going to continue to do our work and continue to take care of our communities and that's what we're going to do. And that's, if, if you're going to work at PARSA, that's what you need to focus on. So I had kind of that, um, that conversation with them. And then I started, I actually started teasing, do you guys know the Chicken Little story? Do you know Chicken Little? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. You don't know that one? I grew up in oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so every time they would talk about what happened, what happened is on social media to go around, Taliban are hunting people, the Taliban are knocking on the doors, you know, and I was doing this in the US to say, well, the, did the Taliban knock on your door? You know, and it was most, almost like 99.5 was just social media, uh, stuff that they did, I found, I said, okay, put your feet on the floor, breathe. Um, but then I tell them the Chicken Little story, which they now have memorized. We now have it in Dari. That's my response when they tell me how awful the Taliban are, is uh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You're going to go into Foxy Loxy's den. You're going to run into his den because you think the sky is falling. So what is it really? So what really, what's happened, I was just, um, the other thing that I did that really, I really changed is I put aside my administration and tr did training and trainings and conversations and training. So my days since then have really been very, very satisfied. But I spend about six hours a day either training my youth or training my uh, staff. And really the result, you know, I, um, I, I was in tears about two weeks ago because my scout staff had to recover. Uh, oh, uh, number one, I said, you were like dead people when I came back. And I said, you know, get to work. Um, but they had to recover this national program in 30, 34 provinces. And they did. I mean, we've got almost 75% of the scoutmasters back up on, and doing troops right now. With, Tala, with the Taliban not even knowing what scouts is, much less caring about it, unless there's some financial benefit for them, which there isn't. 
So uh, I w I, they had managed to put together what's called an orientation, and they are bringing the next level of children in, or youth, teenagers, to be inducted as scoutmasters. And um, with the girls, they had, we had to do boys, and we had to do girls. And with the girls, and they, the electricity had been out at night, so they ran in early to try and iron their new uniforms. But they showed up a little bit late, but I said, okay. I said to them, just how impossible is this? How discouraged are you? How can you, I mean, let, let's talk honestly. You're scouts, you're, we're now inducting you as leaders, but what future is there in Afghanistan? And they're like, there's a future here. Can't quite see it yet, but yeah, there's a future here, Marty. I was just in tears. I was expecting to have to spend an hour with them. And I actually, after about 15 minutes, I had my, my staff stand up and just acknowledge the, I just acknowledge them for doing that in this environment because I'm so intimately involved with it. But they're like, no, we're going to make it happen, Marty. And uh, uh, same thing with the boys. I said, okay, you, you can, you know, being a leader doesn't mean you always see how it's going to happen or it doesn't mean you always feel good about the future. You know, how are you going to do this? And they're like, yeah, we're going to get it done. So that's really the power of cost, really, frankly, cost nothing. That's the power of being in loving with people. And uh, I get it back tenfold and have for the last 20 years from the Afghan people. And I get discouraged. It is really exhausting. I have to wear this long black thing. I was going to bring one and show it, show it to you. I'm just so cranky about it. And I have in actually enjoyed most of my contacts with the Taliban that I work with. They're the lower level. They're not the ones you're hearing it. They're not the ones that are the PR. They're not the face of the Taliban. They actually care about their people. And uh, I say to them, I say, okay, my red line is uh, we need to feed the Afghan people. Don't stop me. And they say, okay, well, that could you, they say, could you do that in my village? I say, we can do, we can do it in your village, but we, we need to do it everywhere. And it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to um, feed all of the Afghan people. I mean, those are the conversations I'm having, you know, with the leadership. They're not the really obnoxious ones that say they're entitled to be recognized by the world. And they're not that level. So I want to just kind of stop there and see what kind of questions you have, Sam. Is this different? One of the one thing that I wanted to do is you can see James, how immersed James is. And he has a very special perspective. I have a similar one. And that's, that's what we have in common, is capturing and communicating. Please. The projects that you are doing and have done have come from the bottom up, mm -hmm. not top down. Mm -hmm. They brought you ideas, and then you helped them develop and implement them. Mm -hmm. That's, is, that's what's unique. That's one of the reasons I'm not letting Parsa grow too big, is so that I always have that freedom. Because it doesn't always look the, initially the way it needs to for us. I'm not a development expert. You know, it doesn't look that way. But yeah. Um, it, is, it is my style. And there are people like me that just fall in love and kind of do the right thing, able to follow that path, because Afghanistan's our passion, not our career. So thank you for that. So questions? Please. So it might be the air conditioning, but I went to the uh, exhibit again, and your body language is exactly like that. <laughs> and I'm so worried who influenced whom. Because they did me. I'm absolutely a, shaped by them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I was just saying, oh, 
Yeah, yeah. I've been there a long time. I've been there a long time. So there's many things about me, I'm sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. Some more questions? Please. There's thousands of Afghans that were working to support the United States troops when they were there. And they had a price on their head for being kind of thing. Is there any truth to that? Yeah. That's the, probably the one group I would 100% endorse come. But the thing is, you know, I was speaking to a writer who's about to publish a book who wanted to know how to, these questions I said to him, I said, listen, Americans really, really, really like black or white, good or bad. They want to know who the good person is and who the bad person is, right? And they, they don't mind a story as long as there's a good person and a bad person. And I said, in Afghanistan, each person, this is my favorite saying to my Afghan people, I say, Afghans are so generous and so loving until they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and in Afghanistan, a cultural perspective is each person is absolutely the best and the worst could stab me in the back. And it's just a really, really different perspective. So what's going on in Afghanistan is that the Taliban are actually a small group, maybe an army of 75,000 for 40 million people who have done a great job of terrorizing the population and intimidating them. I mean, you know, hanging, hanging bodies in Herat of the bandits, that terrorizes <laughs> the population. It's real, it's a, but it's an emotional terror. It's not grounded in the facts of the matter. So <clears throat> basically, they're doing this huge pronouncement, but 15 provinces have girls' schools open. And there are communities in Herat, like again, Herat, there's this district where parents got tired, the girls got tired, the teachers got tired, they just started going to school. They just started going to school. So it's not, I mean, really, really, internationals do not like how messy it is, and it's probably the hope for Afghanistan is that there's this large pronouncement which is mostly for show at the top like women have to wear he the face coverings and there's selected places that that's enforced but women aren't doing that and it we're now I I actually I mean I'm sorry to say this because this, I want to start my online, get my online school started in September, and we're going to be doing, um, which I'm very excited about, we are doing, my Sister for Sisters now are doing support groups for 290 girls in the neighborhood. So now we're going to do an outreach, which includes education and support groups, where they go into the neighborhood, into the homes, pull 10 girls together in the home, and start doing education. That education is going to be much higher quality than what the Taliban, or it's, the Taliban are going to take about five years, if they're in power that long, to, put, to probably recover the level of education they had before, much less make it okay by Sharia. So we're going to start this particular program that is really homeschooling and then having teenagers teach seven-year-olds and we're going to do this and the kids are just so excited about it. Kids, African kids love community service. They just think they're special and they get to boss people around. So it's just like <laughs> love community service. So it's just, it depends on, and Afghanistan's famous for this, which province you're in, who the race is, who the leader is. It depends on what the community wants. It's not going the way it says. Now, they're, uh, Taliban, different people, particularly uneducated, are really, really brutal. And yes, they're running through and killing particularly the pine trees, the Northern Alliance, yeah. Um, but it's not a systematized thing. It's just not. So, yes, the SIVs, 
we promised them they need to get in here, and we mismanaged the evacuation. So I was telling somebody at lunch, you know, my, uh, a colleague of mine said, oh my God, my driver just called me from Qatar. What is he doing in Qatar? He somehow got himself on a plane to Qatar during that evacuation. He's not at risk. So you've got that kind of mess where there are a lot of people who had no business leaving the country. And then you have people, we promised them. That's, that's it with me. And some of them are in danger. But it's vastly exaggerated, vastly exaggerated, in order to get resources and support for doing it. So. Now, James may tell you something different, because I think he's trying to get some people out of the country. I'll be interested in what he says. So, yeah. You said that 15 provinces have girls' schools. How many provinces are there? 34. 34, so almost half. Yeah. And how about the boys' schools? What's boys' the schools are rotten, because I, I work, I have a new a program called Brothers for Brothers. So I, I, uh, I did. I had to do the same thing for boys as for girls because I don't believe in just doing empowering girls. In fact, I believe that if we had spent the last twenty years putting as much into boys as we went into girls, we would have much more community structure for equal rights. So um, boys' schools is, are awful. Teachers aren't showing up. The educate the, they haven't been able to get their Concord exams this year, and I mean I talked. To, there's nothing exciting about. I mean for boys there's nothing like what am I going to do in this country? There's no sense of they have a freedom or a career path. They get to grow a beard, you know, just kind of not fun. Not a sense of fu of future there, so. I think everybody got that point. Well, that's the thing that is wor the worst, is not having hope. Because um, when people have hope, they just do amazing things. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody is saying. It's not accurate. It's not accurate. Private schools, high schools are going, and communities are on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. There's a website called Afghan Analysis you can go to. It's really well-researched and uh, research education. But no, it's not true. It's a nice headline. And in that headline, there is no hope because the Taliban aren't going to budge, the U.S. you know, isn't going to budge, so there's no hope for people. But no, it's not accurate. Is that the best source for us to go to? It's a good, it's one I go to and I learn a lot. It's well researched and they don't draw conclusions. They let you think it through for yourself. So it's a nice piece. So Afghanistan analysis. Yeah, please. What is the situation where they always show that the children are starving, like the young, the babies and that? What, what's your perception of that? that um, the reality? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, what I don't like is that the, the, it feels like they're trying to manipulate the public and countries into giving more assistance. There is no future for this country in humanitarian assistance, none. And it sets up a parallel um, a parallel government, so the international community supporting them, but the Taliban get to make these pronouncements and do all of this social restriction. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And there, there's no, I mean, this country, nobody's figuring out an end game here. So, uh, are children starving? Absolutely. I felt the pressure of friends who've lost their job. I felt the pressure. It's a horrific situation. Uh, and people die in Afghanistan. 
So, I mean, I'm not being callous about it. It is a terrible, kind of a terrible country right now. But uh, we're, I don't know, I can't hear anybody thinking outside of this. What I don't like is the manipulation to keep people participating in humanitarian assistance. And one of the things that I have learned is, is humanitarian assistance keeps quite separate from development. So thus you have refugee tents for 50 years, mm -hmm. generations growing up in refugee camps because they haven't thought it through. We're doing a program, I'm, I, you know, we're doing a program, a humanitarian assistance program through the Scout Network. When we go in and have uh, Scoutmaster select, assess, and give food, and then we're putting that Scoutmaster into a three-part, um, three-phase. One is we give him a stipend, he takes care of his community, he feeds his community, and then the third piece will be getting him work when there is work in Afghanistan. So that's my opinion. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Anything else? Tony, are you familiar with the, this area of Kabul that James has lived in and photographed? Mm -hmm. Are there any particular pictures that uh, strike you uh, emotionally? No, because I live there. So I, I live there. So I just I love the artistry of it. Looks home. Looks like home. Yeah, I love the artistry of it. He's made it look nicer than it really looks. <laughs> I um I've been back for about five years, and this did walking in here was kind of like walking back into home in Afghanistan. It's yeah. just the vivid colors with the plain. Uh, backdrop of, of mud, mud houses, but um, that one, I used to ride my motorcycle around quite often, <laughs> right here at this castle. I think he's um, dignified it, but given insight. You know, I think he's given a deep emotional insight, but dignified, and dignified it. I mean, the, his love and reverence for the country is clear in each picture. And that resonates with me. Anything else? So thank you very much for having me. Thanks everyone for visiting. Thank you very much. And remember on Sunday the 28th, James will be speaking at an Orcas Island at the Orcas Center. And then back here, on Wednesday, the 31st of August, James will be in dialogue with Reverend Terry Kyle, both discussing paths to understanding. James, through his art, and Terry, uh, way he helps us understand the life. So I hope, hope you can all come uh, at the community theater at 7 o'clock on the 31st of August. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.